Great. Hi. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, welcome to um, this is the first of our Police Foundation Friday exchanges. Um, uh, I'm Rick Muir. I'm uh, director of the Police Foundation. Uh, and um, we're going to be holding these exchanges on a monthly basis on a Friday lunchtime. And it's just an opportunity really to have a conversation and a reflection with uh, interesting people um, who have something to say about policing. Uh, and it's as simple as that. And um, you're all very welcome to attend and um, uh, and join in the conversation um, so that there's an opportunity for you to put some uh, questions in the Q&A and, uh, and I can then put those to our, uh, uh, our, our speaker. And today um, we're delighted to welcome Matt uh, Lloyd-Rose, who um, uh, uh, has authored what I think is an absolutely excellent book on, um, on policing in this country. Matt um, was a primary school teacher, he was a carer, um, and he spent um, uh, a year as a special in the Met working in Lambeth, and um, uh, and out of that experience has authored um, this book, uh, Into the Night, uh, which is um, a really uh, excellent um, uh, description of what it is like to be a police officer, and and just the the uh, from the the drama to the sort of mundane kind of reality of being a police officer, and it's and it's extremely well written, and I really do recommend it to you. Um, uh, and um, so, welcome, Matt, um, and it's great to have you with us. Um, I should just say um, to the uh, those joining in, yeah, if you've got um, Matt and I are going to have a bit of a conversation uh, to kick things off. And then if you've got questions or comments you want to make, put them in the uh, in the Q&A uh, function and then I can then um, introduce those into the conversation uh, later on. But do feel free to uh, to do that. I should also say that we are recording this uh, as well and we'll make this available um, uh, online afterwards. So just do sort of bear that in mind uh, when asking your questions and so on. Um, but um Matt, thank you for for joining us. And I just wondered if, just to sort of kick us off, you could describe um, a bit of your backstory and um, basically what you know, how you came to you know join the Met and and write this book. Mm. Thank you so much, Rick. Good afternoon, everyone. Really lovely to be here. I've admired the Police Foundation and their work for. A long time was reading a lot of your papers while I was writing this book, so thank you, Rick. And yeah, I'll say a few words about where the book came from and why I wrote it. So a few years ago, I was on a night shift as a special constable in South Lambeth. I was patrolling with a regular officer and there'd been a report of an escaped Jack Russell on Ephra Road. And my partner and I said, we'd go and check it out. We got to the scene, the four lanes of thick evening traffic. Out, barking its head off, zipping in and out of the cars and the buses. They were emergency stopping and swerving. And we ran into the roads, gesturing to the traffic to try and stop it. And we started sprinting around after this dog. And the Jack Russell was way too fast for us and the faster we ran the faster the dog ran and the more we ran the more the dog seemed to just be enjoying the whole thing and we were bumbling after this dog the cars stopping and starting people were staring at us there was a line of people watching from the pavement and i had this sudden kind of almost out of body experience this moment of perspective and just thought what am i doing here <laughs> not not just with the dog but this whole thing i I'd been a primary school teacher, I never been a police officer, like how how I ended up in that situation. So before before policing, directly before policing, I was a, a primary school teacher, also in South London. It's the neighborhood I lived in as well. In Brixton, I lived a five minute walk from the school uh, where I taught. It was my first job. I was teaching seven year olds, really wonderful children, loads of energy, loads of creativity. But also in that classroom, a lot of children going through quite serious challenges quite early in their lives. So older siblings and gangs, domestic abuse at home, family members in prison, some 
children lacking a permanent address, moving around. It was a really striking experience. I taught for two years. It's the most challenging thing I've done, the most enjoyable thing I've done. But then I left the classroom to go into education research, but wanted to stay close to and rooted in this community where I lived, where I taught, where I later had kids and started bringing up my own family. And I wanted to better understand some of the challenges that my pupils and my families were facing. And I thought like maybe I'll be a youth mentor or something. But then I was on the London Underground one day and saw this one of these adverts for special constables, volunteer police officers, and just thought, yeah, I think I should do that. And I remember my friends were surprised and I was surprised that like, weirdly, even though it's kind of adjacent to teaching, it felt like a kind of swerve away from that. But I found when I stopped and reflected, it did make sense. I've always been fascinated by questions of community and inclusion and education and care. I've always had an appetite for frontline work. I spent a year working as a carer. I volunteered in a homeless shelter on a nightline in a care home for older people. And I had this kind of realization that, of course, the police are the people who see all of these pressing social issues all at once at their most raw. So signed up, started going out on Friday nights on the beat or in the van and just dealing with with everything from um, from drug searches to domestic abuse, from our fights to burglaries, from stabbings to mental health crises and from runaway dogs to illegal hot dog vendors. And I think I'll say a few more words, Rick. Um, I think I was most interested initially in the work with young people involved in London's teen gangs and the serious youth violence problem. I felt like every time I picked up the Evening Standard, that issue was always in the news, claiming many young lives. And I remember being on the first shift, my first ever shift, driving. We jumped out and like chased this shadow along the road and caught him. It was a 13 year old boy. We searched him. There were six of us around this boy and a group of boys came out of the estate where he lived and they started shouting at us and this sort of scene developed. And it was just completely bewildering because one minute I'd been a teacher, a trusted authority figure. And the next I felt like a kind of figure of suspicion for these young people. It was like we were caught in a sort of standoff, a bit like we were almost like rival sports teams, like facing off against each other. And that was powerful because of the experience. But also I asked one of the officers about it afterwards, if a lot of the work involved dealing with young people. And he said, yeah, too much. There's all these messed up families expecting us to be social workers, but we're not. I remember later being out with the gang's task force and asking them, like, how do you solve this? Like, what's the answer here? And just again, the general sense of from people who were working really hard to try and deal with this, a sense of bewilderment. And one person saying the only way you could solve this would be a bomb, like one on each estate, one here, one here, one here, and you just start all over again. And basically, I was really struck by the way that police are sent to deal with this issue of serious youth violence, but don't really know what to do about it or aren't really equipped to address a problem of that magnitude. And I found the same was true of mental health crises, domestic abuse, homelessness. And most of the officers that I chatted to wanted to catch criminals, but instead felt like they were being sent to respond to these complex, entrenched social issues that they felt unequipped to tackle. And I think when I first joined, I also sort of thought we'd be fighting crime. I was so used to that sort of narrative, fighting crime, arresting criminals, but quickly saw that the reality is just so much more complex and that society hands policing these really complex caring duties and that the emergencies that the police deal with are very rarely just total one-offs and are more often almost like um, slow motion 
periods. And it was that kind of curiosity that led me to start thinking about writing the book, just the sense that these criminals that we were arresting were not like calculating masterminds. They were vulnerable people caught up in often really damaging cycles or toxic structures. And we would turn up and instead of being able to like resolve or improve a situation, ended up in the uncomfortable situation of needing to control people who were really in need of care and kind of in the process enabling that lack of care. And I could see that for a lot of officers that led to quite an understandable frustration and in some cases quite deep cynicism. I'll just share one more little story, Rick, um, while I'm while I'm going, but there was towards the end of my time policing, I arrested a man who in the book I've called Anthony and Anthony was taking drugs in a phone box outside KFC on Brixton High Street. And it was pretty clear cluck. We searched him, we found a crack pipe down his trousers. We called up, turned out that he wasn't allowed to have any drugs paraphernalia on him anyway. And so we took him to the police station to arrest him. And he was in a bad state. He was very shaky and agitated. But this odd thing happened when we got to the police station that it was like, as we went through the custody procedures, the search, Anthony just did everything really quickly and smoothly and methodically with this kind of amazing, unsurprised proficiency. And it made sense afterwards when I saw his paperwork and realized that he'd been arrested 77 times before. And that situation kind of became emblematic of the rut that we are currently in, in that kind of community policing, that Anthony is locked in a vicious cycle, but so are the police and so are our like, wider systems of support and care. And I had this kind of inkling that until something changed, we were just going to keep arresting and re-arresting and re-arresting Anthony. And I think we'll we'll talk about good policing, what good policing looks like. The best police officers I met had these deep reserves of patience, of curiosity about people, about individuals, their situations. And ultimately, they were kind of experts in, unacknowledged experts in care, really, rather than, or as well as being experts in coercion. And that idea of care came to feel a bit like a kind of missing link in policing. Not that it's absent, but it's the prominence of it. And so that's a bit of a, gives you a bit of a sense of where the book came from, the journey within the book, some of the sorts of situations. It's not a book that tries to provide all the answers. I don't consider myself a massive expert on policing. I was was actually involved with the, with them, the special constabulary in Lambeth for about three and a half years. We tied it up and compressed it in the book to make it coherent. But it was that kind of um, that kind of time scale. But it was very much I saw a slice of this role on Friday nights. And so it's kind of brought in that in that spirit of this is not a definitive account of policing, but I hope it. Sources for some of the conversations that we need to have. Yeah, there we go. Back to you, Rick. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, really, really interesting. And one of the big themes in the book, which it would be good to get discuss with you, is yeah, what is policing? Um, you know, what it, what what is this thing? What what are we? What is it trying to achieve? And um, you you do quote in the book um, rightly because I think he basically gets it sort of bang on. Um, Egon Bittner, um, the criminologist who who does root it in the powers that the police have, you know, so he roots mm. the, the notion of policing in this, in the unique powers that the police have, um, even though he also, you know, he doesn't think it's only about power, but he's trying, he's trying to explain why, why do the police do all of these things, uh, you know, all of these different yeah. functions that we expect of them. Yeah, so he yeah. roots it, he roots it in power. Um, and yet in your book, you're saying, well, that's okay, but, um, uh, there's this the problem the need for care as the sort of other side the sort of care and coercion <laughs> elements of policing that the the care element is 
um, less acknowledged, less kind of, um, uh, you know, we're not preparing police officers for that aspect of, the, of their role. It's not as prominent in the way we're um, trying to recruit people into policing, the skills that we're giving them. That I mean, is that is that a fair description of where you end up on that question? Yeah, gosh, there's a lot in there, isn't there, Rick? It's, um, yeah, it's it's huge, that. And Egon Bittner, this sociologist, criminologist from the States, writing in the 60s, 70s and beyond, it came to be a really kind of important thought partner in the book. He describes policing as the best known and least understood institution. And that still feels quite on the money. Um, and a sense that from a very young age, we have these develop these ideas of the police and what they are. But actually, when you stop and think about what do we actually expect police to do? What is the role of the police? And obviously, that's a shape shifting question that depends on the context that you're in. But it's it's a much more fraught and complex question than than perhaps a lot of the time we acknowledge. And almost I think the fact that that question seems to so self evidently answer itself is part of the part of the problem that we get into is that we end up with a simplistic narrative around what policing is often within public life political narratives so it can become the sort of more nuanced conversations that we need to have around it can be difficult to have and kind of perversely it can end up being difficult to sort of have a reality based conversation both about what police are actually spending their time doing and then about what we'd like police to spend their time doing I mean, the other thing that I'd add there is just a sense that having, I mean, my, the worlds that I know really well alongside policing are the worlds of education and social care and, and sort of those, those sort of parallel systems. And it's just, it's, I find it striking that somehow it feels possible to talk about policing in isolation from those broader systems and the aims of those broader systems. There's, it, there's often you can the question like how would we fix policing somehow seems like a sensible question on its own whereas actually it it doesn't really mean a lot if it's not asked at the same time as how would we fix policing within the context of this broader system and, and how does that broader system around policing also need to change so i do think there's there's something in that um let me throw one more thing in just the tangible thing because it's um I found one thing I found striking. I was on one of my final shifts out with a, a neighborhood police team officer in the Tulse Hill estate, really seasoned officer. He'd been, I think, been around for about 30 years. He knew everyone in the estate. And a lot of the shift was him knocking on doors. I popped in to see an older lady in her 80s who had very few social connections. And he it became clear that was he was often popping in there to see that to see that woman and to check in on her. And he popped in to see a family with learning disabilities who often had issues with bullying in the local community. And there were, and he had all these little interactions with people. There were all of these moments. But one of the things, not only did that feel like a sort of powerful or useful thing to do, albeit he still felt very limited in what he could achieve in terms of addressing those situations beyond just popping in and forming connections but one thing that i think is worth pulling out is that certainly in in my experiences those were precisely the things that did not get written down and were not recorded and would therefore not be seen and not be celebrated and again some forces i'm sure are, 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 have ways of doing that i don't want to suggest that never happens but equally it was striking to me thinking of all the things we've done tonight all of that stuff it's going to be totally undocumented and un invisible to, to anyone. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, really interesting. I actually just, I, I wanted to get at this issue of, of of good policing. And there's a bit in the book which stood out to me where um, you're with an officer uh, on patrol in, in Vauxhall, I think. And, um, uh, and she's going around um, doing a lot of uh, talking, having a lot of conversations to people. Um, and I just... Yeah, I just wanted to quote a bit of that because I think it kind of um, sort of. Uh, I, I I think this is what Robert Peel had in mind when he's talking about mm. friend friendship and service. So yeah. it says here, um, 
Great policing is a mysterious blend of knowledge, skill, judgment and values that can be difficult to pick apart. I asked the regular about her approach. Quote, I genuinely believe in prevention rather than cure, she replied. If you talk to someone early on in the evening, they're much more likely to get on with you if you that if you pull them out of well, they're much more likely to get on with you if you pull them out of a club later on. I joined the job 14 years ago, and in all that time I've never been assaulted. Policing is all about getting on with people, and not enough officers think that like that. And then you go on to say she kept pausing to chat to people, conducting short stops without making them feel like stops. She was intelligence gathering, but also just being friendly. She was like a diplomat working the room at a cocktail party, moving seamlessly from one group to another. Over the early part of the evening, she must have greeted several hundred people, imprinting our presence onto their minds, affecting their outlook and behaviour in small but significant ways. I mean, I just think that, I mean, that leapt out at me because I think um, if people, um, uh, that it seems to me is is basically what the Pelian model of policing you know ought to be about. I mean, it's trying to describe something which is um, much more about relationships and engagement, um, and uh, well, it's about those things first, and you know, coercion as a last resort rather than mm. um, coercion as the first resort. Um, is that I mean, is that basically what is that what you think? Do you do you agree that that is um, that's what policing ought to be like at its best? Yeah, I really enjoyed that shift with that officer and and her her kind of walkthrough of her approach. I mean, one thing I found striking, which is another thing that Egon Bittner noticed when he was out. And he, he wrote about it in his paper about policing Skid Row. And he talked about the kind of um, highly developed relational skills of certain officers that were like pivotal in the way that they worked. But again, kind of under acknowledged. And almost, I think, I found that the, the quality of the relational work that I witnessed in the police tended to seem to kind of come down to just like who was the individual who was the individual officer you were working with and did they like that way of working was that kind of who they were and how they showed up rather than it feeling like something that was designed in to the institution um and again not there's there's a lot about good communication in, in my training again i don't want to i want to suggest that this is not yeah. talked about um and certainly i remember my first ever training session at hendon a lot of it was that message of policing is about getting on with people and communication is key came through really clearly but at the same time wasn't really reinforced in terms of kind of rigorously training us to become that kind of officer and to understand what that would mean in a range of different contexts and how that would how that would play out so it did feel like in my experience there was quite a lot of space to be a very gung ho officer who didn't focus on developing those relational skills at all. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, thank you. Well, we, I, I wanted to get into a bit about how um, the sort of how all this, how the how the work and the kind of work that officers do affects their their mindset and their uh, and the and the kind of organisational culture. We just got a question here from um, Jamie Hobday who says. Uh, in one of the great early books on police culture will, by William Muir, no relation, uh, street corner <laughs> politicians, uh, he describes officers in America as reacting to their street experiences by, gener by generally either developing a cynical or a tragic outlook on life stroke the public. The tragic outlook sees the bigger picture of people's uh, of people's and family struggles and has some empathy as opposed to the cynical which blames them for their own situation does Matt see any truth in that from his experiences yeah yeah I I did and I've read that book as well actually and liked it a great deal um it's it's interesting isn't it I mean I think cynicism was an ever-present threat for a lot of the officers I worked with and it it's funny it's it's kind of easy to be cynical about cynicism and obviously I don't think there's a place for cynicism in the police and I think it needs to be challenged but also I could understand how some officers had reached that place from an experience of showing up at for example domestic abuse situations at which 
they didn't feel like they were able to be effective. They were perhaps attending a property that attended many times before and cynicism set in. There is something um, that tragic perspective. I mean, I th I th there's something profound in that because I have found that there's in the role something about the ability to handle the scale and the repetition, the fact that you're getting these like sometimes near identical situations coming at you and the ability to recognize each of those situations as a totally individual human scenario at the same time as appreciating the scale and the broader patterns. And so there's something about that kind of, I don't know if tragic is a word that would be, can imagine it not being a, like a hugely useful word for a lot of people in terms of the associations it might conjure up. There's something about remaining alive to the individuality of each person that you're interacting with and each scenario that you're involved with. Yeah. No, that's really that's really important, Matt. And um, one of the other things that you you um, touch on in the in the book is um, you do talk about some of the cultural issues which have subsequently come out through mm. the Casey review, um, uh, and notably in your book, you I mean it's it's, it's very striking the um, the you know how prominent um, misogynist sort of everyday kind of misogynistic comments were in. Uh, in in um, uh, in the course of the uh, of of the shift, and um, I just wondered if you could say a bit more about that and what and and you and, and, and why you think that um, uh, was such a problem and um, and 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 what if anything we might we might be able to do about that. Yeah, that was one of the big surprises for me when I started policing. That again, um, coming from being a primary school teacher and, and I knew that being a police officer wasn't going to feel like being a primary school teacher but at the same time I'd been in a community facing role working with other professionals who have to have conversations about people in that community and so it was stunning to me to feel the kind of unruliness of the sexual banter sexist banter misogynistic remarks and um, it it did take me by surprise and um, it was everything from um from the sort of just background hum of of chat in the van on a boring shift where you've been driving around for hours and people i don't know saying um tell me a come up with a film title that expresses what your sex life is like um right through to much more predatory behavior like driving up and down Clapham High Street with the express intention of talent spotting in the words of the officers that I was there with um, or, or dealing with an individual and then and, and as soon as that individual has moved on making a misogynistic remark about them and so I don't know it's um it felt very unchecked I was very surprised that especially given that the there was I've noticed a lot of officers being very careful in their language about race and heard officers kind of policing each other's language around race. And it felt like even though there's a long way for the Met to go and the, if you look at the outcomes around race, like there is institutional racism that's still there and you can't ignore what the statistics say. But um, but I, I could see that there had been efforts to make it make an impact there, whereas it was um it was striking feeling just the way that this was sort of running through the culture in a, in a, in a much more unchecked way and obviously it depend which offices you were with which van you were in um as to the degree the degree of that but there was something that it felt like it had been normalized to me um so that would be that would be one thought on it in terms of in terms of what to do i mean there's all sorts of practical things that people have talked about i think the bigger thing that came through for me was just a sense of it links up to the cynicism in my mind that in the absence of a clarity of purpose in the absence of clarity of what is supposed to happen in relation to these really challenging situations that police are sent to deal with it, that it, there's a sort of there can be a sort of vacuum of purpose that opens up and there's 
there's space there for boredom, for cynicism, there's space there for toxicity to develop. If you've got a group of people who really understand why they're there, really feel purposeful, really feel like they're making a difference, have been recruited into that to make that difference, then you're far less likely to have those sorts of unruly cultures emerging. Yeah. And on the, I mean, on this, I'm, I'm interested in this question on recruitment, because, um, I mean, do you think that, um, uh, you know, the, the police have got um, recruitment right? Because, I mean, there's still, um, I think I was saying to you the other day, I mean, I, I, I was watching a recruitment video um, for one police force, which was was kind of making it out like police joining the police was like joining the SAS, you know, and you sort of you know get you get a balaclava on and you sort of you know and it's kind of action hero stuff, uh, and then of course when you join the police, um, you know it it is much more mundane than that. I mean there is drama and there is excitement and there are you know you, you, you know that there, there are um, serious incidents which. Um, have that kind of quality to them um, but there's a lot of I mean reading your book there's an awful lot of um, um, you know just kind of driving around looking for stuff to to do I mean and there's you know there's a bit of just kind of and I know a lot of it, it it's on sort of night shifts and so on it's a very particular part of policing mm. but um, you know there's uh, I mean do you think that some of the maybe some of the cynicism is sort of linked to a kind of mismatch between the expectations people have of this job when they join it and what the reality of it is. Yeah, totally. And I, and I felt like some of the people I worked alongside were very committed to maintaining their belief in that promise, in the idea that yeah. this was like an action, exciting action role. And so, yeah, absolutely. And it's a, oh, I'm getting... I'm getting joined by a four-year-old. Let me know. That's okay. <laughs> I'll, uh, Hello. I'll, I'll just uh, do Well, uh, Matt has my, my sympathy because I'm... Uh... Uh, that's always happening to me. <laughs> so, uh, those of you who sent in questions, um, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I am gonna come to all your questions in a, in a moment. We'll just give Matt a, a time to come in, but... Um, there we go. There we go. No worries. It, it's happened <laughs> to me. On, it's happened to me on many, many occasions. So yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's a bit. It's a bit like that. That news presenter, who, uh, that journalist on the BBC, when really, he's. Uh, um, the, these are these are the challenges of uh, of of, of home communicate home. working from home. Um, yeah. Well, I'm I'm at Ernst and Young, weirdly at a conference, so I'm more likely to get sort of chased by a cleaner or something. But uh, yeah, fewer, <laughs> fewer four-year-olds, <laughs> fewer fewer people. children, but, but lots yeah. of other people around me. Um, so um, we, yeah, we've got a, a few of the questions that I just wanted to uh, to to put to you, um, and. Um, yeah, one of my colleagues at the Police Foundation, who was herself a, a police officer previously, she says, um, I have my own dog story from my days as a neighbourhood police officer. We were on foot patrol and an absolutely distraught dog walker came to us uh, saying his charge had run away. We used our local knowledge of the narrow roads and alleyways on our beat to work out where the dog might be and tracked it down and united it with the dog walk walker who was overjoyed. The resultant photo was one of our best liked on Twitter. Yeah. For me, this anecdote shows the importance of foot patrol, being present in, in, in the communities and taking the time to do things that aren't necessarily crime related. How can officers make sure to carve out time for these personal interactions, given the pressures on cr of crime and demand? And how can we as commentators, researchers, better make the case for this in the current climate? Yeah, well, wow, good question. Gosh, I'm, yeah, well, I'm glad that I'm glad the dog was safely restored. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's it's funny, isn't it? Because there's so many sort of chicken and eggs in all of in all of that. In as much as it feels like so many of the pressures that the police are under at the moment come from the fact that there's a kind of by a process of sort of titration, there's a level of pressure that just pours down and down and down onto onto the police where they're picking up the pieces in the environment where the safety nets have been increasingly cut away. So I guess the the kind of non, non sort of immediately pragmatic answer is that that's that's the sort of conversation we need to have really about and what what are we going to do to make our work in relation to these issues much more sustainable and and how do we work 
with communities to do that because I, I think it's it's beautifully put the um the question is point about the importance of foot patrol and thing in and close to the community and certainly the policing that I've I found that looked to me most effective was conducted by the people who had the most intimate knowledge of the community but also who've kind of manifested the most affection for the community as well and kind of knew it at a at a, at a rich and rounded level and I think where where it, the policing that I saw and was involved in felt thinner was where we felt almost like a kind of external supervisory force within that space yeah. rather than an enmeshed part of the community. Yeah, and it's, this links really well to another question which Kate Lloyd's put up, which I'll, I'll read out in a minute. But what, one of the things that struck me in the book is, as well is, is um, you talk about um, collective memory and there are lots of um, you talk a lot about lots of figures, activist figures and others um, in in Lambeth who um, uh, who have been involved in policing, interacting with policing over the years. And um, uh, and, you know, you're, you go to a great deal of trouble in the book to kind of understand that history, which I, I thought was really um really uh, good and um kate kate has a question on this so in the book he clearly kept time to understand the history of the relationship between the police and and lambeth communities in your experience to what extent was this sort of contextual his history provided to local officers and is this something you think uh, would be useful and should happen more as a matter of course to improve understanding uh, and cultural competence yeah so i mean in in short i I don't know the extent to which that happens right now. It certainly didn't happen for me in my experience as a special constable, either either in my main training at Hendon or in any kind of inductions at Lambeth. If I, at Lambeth it was there were more kind of euphemistic references to, and obviously well, there's a very sad history around this and there's been a lot of tension around this, but within a minute of preamble at a at a session rather than rather than us being immersed in those stories. But yeah, it, certainly there was something stark about policing central Brixton and not feeling like there was a live awareness from the officers that I was working with of the recent history of the police in, in Brixton. I kind of of all of all places really thinking about the 91, 1981 riots uprisings and everything that emerged emerged from uh, emerged from that it feels like that that sense of certainly for me thinking about things that the met needs to do one of it one of them i think is just really getting it getting to know its own its own recent history its own its own story and that story being live within the blood of the institution and, and being told and retold and the local stories for people in individual areas because it I don't know I remember when I was certainly when I became a teacher in Brixton the head teacher at the time and she would she'd been a head teacher in 1981 so so she was talking from experience but yeah. we had a big session about where are you what are the tensions how might you be perceived what like what what what's happened here and then how do we interact positively with those with those stories now and, and and build out from there so yeah it does um it's the kind of thing that could sound a bit trivial but actually it feels really really important and and even more recent stories like until until fairly recently outside Brixton police station there was the a plane tree a London plane tree hung with lanterns and and flowers that was a memorial to um to Ricky Bishop and, and Sean Rigg who both died inside the custody suite not not a huge amount of time ago um, within the last 20 years and that tree was cleared away when the plaza was redeveloped but certainly it feels really it feels really important to me that the those the stories of those individuals and those events which are so recent I don't know that I write in the book that it feels like there should be like a plaque on the police station about that as in it feels like that needs to remain that needs to be acknowledged it's like it's obviously terrible, um, but we, it needs to be like acknowledged, and the Met need to just, I think, 
be more at home accepting the history that they have in order to then work with that history and move forward. Yeah, it's it's really striking. I mean, I remember when I, I used to be a local councillor and I remember going to community, police community meetings and um, and often having these really sort of asymmetric related conversations where you'd have members of the community who had who'd lived there all their lives and knew mm -hmm. you know knew all the history right and and yeah, remembered yeah. it and um, and a lot of it was really painful and um we're, we're sort of ex and and you could only really understand where they were coming from in relation to the police if you understood that history and then you'd have um you know um uh two police constables there who literally had no clue about this. I mean, it was like they'd yeah. landed from outer space. You know, they just sort of, um, they were relatively new in post. They didn't understand it. They thought some people were being really aggressive to them and they didn't understand yeah. why you're being so aggressive to me. I'm, you know, why, you know, what's the, what's your problem with me? Um, and, and I, and I remember t taking the off, talking to the officers afterwards and saying, you know, you've got to appreciate that, that you know, people have seen a lot of, policing over the last sort of 40 odd years and the, and 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 people here remember that and you know and um and it is it, yeah it's just bizarre that police officers are, are in that situation where they're just not they're not familiar with the history of uh, of of the of those communities and the way in which the, um, those communities have experienced policing over a long period of time yeah and i mean i found it strange the first few times i went out as a police officer just in a way, realizing, of oh course, people just that people don't realize I'm a new police officer. I've barely any idea what I'm doing. They're just interacting with me as the manifestation of this institution, and kind yeah. of sort of I I in that moment embody all of their preconceptions and beliefs about that institution in that moment. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's yeah, it, yeah. It's about. I mean, you talk about that in the, in the book about how you. Yeah, you're you're almost becoming a different person and putting on the uniform and and and, it, and it's and everything that that goes with it. Um, uh, we got a question from uh, uh, Penelope. Um, uh, in the case of fifty percent of domestic abuse crimes, the alleged victim will not cooperate with the police. In your experience or view, what are the reasons for this? Are the police uh, the right people to attend uh, those sorts of incidents? Yeah, it's complicated, isn't it? And um, I mean, again, it feels like one of those situations where by the time the police are involved in that situation, the question for me is what were all the other moments or potential kind of touch points or relationships that could have been involved in that situation, perhaps from other institutions, that would mean that we're not just interacting at that moment of crisis. Because, yeah, I mean, I think I don't I don't really know the answer to that question. Certainly it was it's incredibly it's in, it's incredibly complicated and it felt like it was just a much, much bigger part of the police role than I realized. And again, perhaps it's the a, a feature of working at the night time, but it felt like there was this steady pulse of domestic abuse calls coming out. And I just, the first few shifts, it, it blew my mind. I just couldn't believe, I just had, I'd had no sense of the scale, the scale of that issue. So in terms of how police respond more effectively, again, that feels to me like another example of the question where, of a situation where we're sort of looking in the wrong place almost, it's like, Maybe I'm sure there are things that police could do more effectively. I'm sure there is other training that police could be given. I'm not saying that I'm not trying to suggest the police don't have any agency here, but at the same time, it feels like actually the 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 better question for me is like what as a broader social care support infrastructure can we do to address domestic abuse? And then within that. What is the role of the police? It's almost I feel that like some of these questions become so daunting because they manifest the fact that so much is put on the shoulders of police, like unrealistic expectations are on the shoulders of police. And then we end up having these conversations about how can the police address this? And it's for me thinking, well, you know, how can we all how can this whole thing address this, this whole system and structure? And then where do the police slot in? Like, what, where do they bring their 
specific particular value yeah yeah and well i wanted to ask you this because in a way there's a sort of because i mean some of the you know when you're describing some of the shifts there's i mean one of the things that comes across is how sort of um and you know maybe uh, this is probably where um uh, the sense of tragedy or even cynicism comes from sometimes is the sort of um there is a sort of futility around it you know that it feels like because you're not able to solve these problems you're just sort of seeing the same people um dealing with the same things and you know, and you just get this sort of sense of wow this this just feels really kind of futile and yet at the same time you know that policing is necessary that, that it's important and that you know you can safeguard people and do all sorts of things i mean do you what um and this is a sort of big question but what um uh, what what was your sense of um you know what what can we achieve you know what what at our best can we achieve given the given that we're not able to solve all of these problems and given that we're you know we're, we're only there for a short period of time and all the rest of it you know i mean were there things you know where there there shifts when you got home and you sort of thought actually uh, you know we really ch achieved something really important there and i and 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 you know and you were pleased about it um and i just say that just because there, there's, there's so many points in the book where it does just feel like um um you know yeah you're just you're just sort of dealing with things that you can't solve uh and 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 that that feels very frustrating and 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 it felt reading it, it felt very frustrating so i just wondered if you could reflect on yeah, what what you? I mean, and I know we're just we're talking about response policing. We're talking about being on a night yeah. shift and all the rest of it. But what what do you think it was? Uh, you know, it, it it does achieve. Yeah, and and I wanted that frustration to feel tangible for the reader in the book. I didn't want the book to be frustrating and boring to read, but I wanted to bring to life the, a, a sense of that of that frustration for the reader. Um, in terms of what what policing can achieve, I mean, th there's something about having an institution that is always available and that has that flexibility, that has that proximity, that potential for the kind of intimate knowledge of a place, of people, of who's in this house or what disputes being going on over there. There's something about like that an institution with that flexibility that is out in the world that isn't like a social worker with a caseload and uh, under tons of pressure with their cases or isn't like a teacher who is like within inside the school someone who is like a mobile entity within a community um uh, there's so much potential and actually one of the things that i write about in the book and that occurred to me was that the police are under a lot of pressure but there are all, are all moments where there is a lot of time sloshing around if you're on foot patrol or if you're out in a van or there's there are moments when there is time sloshing around and and there are and it did occur to me that there's if we can define a bit more clearly what a meaningful response would look like i don't know for example to someone who's begging at a cash point where in my experience we went along and asked people to get up and move on and that was it and and again, this is my sliver of experience, and I'm sure there are officers who are acting a lot more effectively or have better resources at their fingertips. But if we can define a bit more clearly in relation to some of these issues, like what would a meaningful response look like in that moment where that interaction happens? It felt to me like there was there were kind of lost chances when I was policing, all these brushes with people and thinking, well. I mean, the domestic abuse question is a perfect one. I remember going to one situation and where, where where someone, a man had phoned up about his brother threatening him. And and we went there and the man got very agitated and the situation escalated. And ultimately we we left, we ended up leaving him in a very agitated state without without really feeling like we'd achieved very much. But I remember leaving that situation feeling like, there was an opportunity there for something. There's a very this individual struggling with mental health it has there's is in need of support and is probably receiving support in certain places. And we had an opportunity there for something, but but we didn't really know 
what we could bring in that moment. So it's almost something for me about defining a bit more clearly what what would it mean in those situations to do that. And again, yeah. probably some of that can come through looking at like points of light from within the existing system, whether it's individual officers or teams or forces or uh, experiments that are taking place or or adjacent institutions. Like what do social workers do in some of those situations? How do they how do they interact with that? Because there could be skills and knowledge that is highly transferable. It doesn't turn a police officer into a social worker, but might enable them to more effectively handle that situation and as a consequence sort of bring down the pressure on on themselves in the process. And is that, yeah, I wanted to ask you about this question. You talked about points of light and I, I wanted to ask you about how you go about um, sort of change in, in policing. And, and, of course, and we're talking a bit about how we change, not just yeah. policing, but with the way the police interact with other public services as well. And sometimes when you sort of, you know, with all of the social challenges that are out there, it can all kind of feel too big, you know, almost yeah. like overwhelming. Yeah. Um, and I just wondered what your thoughts were on, um, yeah, how you go about doing change in organisations that are, um, you know, dealing with the kind of complexities you're talking about that have, um, uh, you know, that have long-standing cultures, aspects of which can be quite problematic, um, you know, all of that. I mean, what, what are your reflections on how um, uh, yeah, how change can come about in that kind of context? Yeah, so, so, so I mean, on one level, it would be great for us to have a bigger conversation about policing, really reality-based conversation about policing and where we are and the wider system, and I hope that that happens. And and that I wrote this book in this the spirit of the sense that it's these kinds of things can be useful. Like I just saw sort of someone talking about a TV series and the chat, and so yeah. these these sorts of things can can spill over and can reshape and unsettle narratives in productive ways. But I have to say that the most the things that make me most hopeful and excited are the places where just new things on the ground start happening that demonstrate that different ways of working are possible and that different ways of being effective are, are possible as well. So I don't know, it's it's so well known that I'm almost like wary of mentioning it, but like the Scottish Violence Reduction Unit's work to deal with youth violence as a public health issue, I mean, the fact that that's so well known is really exciting, as in it feels like someone has pioneered a different kind of approach that's really got people's attention and rather than like winning an abstract argument someone's just started doing something that works and is more evidence-based and and it becomes then kind of both enticing and also kind of awkward if like someone over there is starting to get results on a really intractable seeming issue it becomes awkward like not to make those sorts of changes across the rest of the system and Likewise, I don't know as much as I'd like to about the right care, right person work from Humberside. But again, it feels like that's something that's been pioneered in a local area that's suggesting a different approach to how police officers might interact with with mental health. And and then also, I think it, there's there's a lot of points of light outside policing that feel important too. There's, I was talking to a charity recently called Grapevine in the Midlands who do all sorts of work in power and communities across the Midlands to solve their biggest challenges, bringing the police into that. Again, all the solutions don't all need to come from the police. The police can be part of points of light from elsewhere in the system. But certainly when at the moments when I feel least hopeful about the ability to change the system at a massive abstract level, the thing that I turn to is actually on the ground in this community over here in West London, you can point to something that is going on that is developing new proof points for the system. And that's for me feels like the that's what gets me excited. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. And I'll just we, we just got one last question, which I'll just put to you just before we close, which is Sarah's asked. I won't read it out because mm -hmm. we haven't got much time, but just, you know, uh, she refers to 
um, you know, number of officers who are on long term sick or on restricted duties and so on. And, uh, you know, she's asking, are, you know, do, are we supporting police officers enough, with, you know, given the amount of trauma that they're experiencing and that witnessing, um, you know, that, um, you know, that is making them uh, ill in many cases? You know, is, is there enough support there for, for police officers? Yeah, a great question. I mean, I don't know, as in I'm not close enough yeah. to that to really understand what goes on, but certainly it feels crucial that there, there would be, and I can't imagine that there is, certainly when um, knowing the kinds of support that exist within certain social work teams to yeah. manage one's own health and well-being in relation to being close to so much trauma, Again, it's an it's another place where like there are people who who know how to do there are adjacent institutions who know how to do this really well. So why why wouldn't we look to that and think about how does this apply? But it kind of comes back to me to where we started as well that the fact that that kind of care work, being close to really vulnerable people at their most vulnerable moments, being close to so much trauma. That's not really the narrative around policing, and therefore it's it's hard for the careful police officers, for one another, for care within those forces. It's hard for that to kind of have the the urgency at a visible external level as well. And so, yeah, I think it's it's a great question, and almost certainly, a, just a, a, an essential thing that should be part of a police officer's life is a, a, a very clear way to look after yourself in that role yeah fantastic well look thank you so much matt um we've we're we're, we're out of time now but we're um so grateful to you for joining us um on the first of these friday exchanges so um uh, thank you uh, very much for making the time and um i do recommend uh for people to go and um, uh, uh, get Matt's book. Um, it really is an excellent read and one of the best books I've read on um, on policing uh, and what it is like to to, to work in policing. So uh, and it's extremely well written. So um, and it really yeah it really gets you thinking about what what policing is for and what it's about. So um, so thank you Matt for writing it and thank you for making the time to join us this afternoon um, and. Um, uh, just to say thank you all for joining us as well and uh, do watch out on our Twitter feed. We're going to be doing um, uh, more of these events on a monthly basis. Uh, so we'll let you know about our next speaker, which will be coming up uh, before Christmas. Uh, so do just watch our social media feeds for that. Um, but um, thanks very much, Matt. Um, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks so much, Rick. Thanks. Bye, everyone.